All right, it's the end of the session. Uh, this is Bob's uh, Roadmap to Success. Basically, um, I think what we have going on is we have, Bob is not an aggressive dog, I think Bob is an insecure dog. And I think uh, his lunging and barking behavior is really an attempt to try to get the people, uh, to have more distance between him and the people that he's fearful of. Um, he's also a really skittish dog, and there have been a lot of things throughout the session that indicate to me that the breeder probably didn't socialize him. He was probably born in an outdoor environment or a barn or something like that, and probably didn't have a lot of exposure. Without going through the whole critical socialization period, again, this is the second time we're filming this, um, puppies are born fearless, and anything that they're exposed to, really from week two to week uh, really 12 to 16, is uh, usually they're pretty okay with. And anything that they need to experience after that, they're naturally a little bit wary of. This is why when a puppy is young, we want to get around a lot of other dogs, people, surfaces. When the dogs came in, they were fearful of the surface, of the tile, and of the wood. That tells me a dog didn't really spend much time inside. Um, and it's really important we socialize and over-socialize a dog when it's a puppy so that it really has a confidence of all this exposure and experiences so it feels good about itself as confidence in these situations. I think Bob's case, he's insecure, and so he doesn't have a lot of confidence. And then we have some things that the guardians were doing unintentionally and were kind of confusing him. One of the things I spotted was uh, the guardians, and it's a very natural human thing to do, is if a dog is suffering or distressed, we pet it and we say it's okay. Well, we can, that can be problematic in a couple reasons. Number one, anything our dog is doing when we pet it is what we're reinforcing. So if the dog is nervous and I pet the dog when it's nervous, I'm making it more nervous, just very slightly. But if we do this over and over and over again, that can really have a dramatic impact. So uh, to help the guardians with that, I went over petting with a purpose. So if Bob comes up and nudges or barks for attention, the guardian's gonna tell him to sit. When he sits, we're gonna pet him under his chin and say the word sit and only the word sit. Then we pet him for as long as we want after that. But the dog has to do something to earn it first. Um, and that way we stop petting the dog for no reason and especially not doing it when it's uh, and doing something inappropriate. Now the other thing is I see a lot of dogs that are nervous and people will, in addition to petting it, they'll try to use a soothing tone. And usually we use the same thing over and over. It's okay, good boy. It's okay, good boy. Dogs learn through association, repetition, and timing. Good timing. You have three seconds to correct or reward the dog for them and make a connection. Uh, but it has to be repeated a lot. Well, if every time the dog is nervous, we say, it's okay, good boy. We can create a command word, it's okay, good boy, means get nervous or anxious or fearful or whatever it is. This is why for our puppy class, every time our puppies at the end of the class are nice and relaxed, we pet them and we say settle or zen or chill. We're putting it in context Then later on when the dog's crazy and we say settle, they know what we mean. So uh, to help the guardians with that, we also went over a watch word of paycheck. So we come in the room, we see someone's petting the dog and the dog's standing, we say paycheck. That just means I think you may have forgotten to pet with a purpose. The person should stop petting, tell the dog to sit. When it sits, pet it under its chin. One thing I forgot to mention, when a dog feels proud about itself, his nose is parallel to the ground or tilted up. So whenever possible, we'd like to pet Bob under the chin, especially when we're rewarding him for petting with a purpose of passive training. We want to never pet Bob by patting the top of his head. Insecure dogs look down. This creates a downward nose orientation. Now you can scratch his butt or anything else, just never pet him on top of the head. And if possible, try to pet him under his chin as much as you can. Uh, now we also went over passive training, which is simply recognizing and rewarding the dog when it does desired actions and behaviors. So every time the dog comes up to me, I'm gonna pet it say here. I would recommend the guardians change the word from come to here because the guardians have been saying the same command words multiple times. And the more we say it without following through, the less that we mean it. So from now on, I want the guardians to say it one time and then make it happen. So, uh, now, uh, for passive training, we can supplement that by every time the dog comes to me on its own, I pet it and say, here. Well, after I do that enough repetition, then the dog's like, if I hear here and go to the human, that means that they're going to pet me. If I hear sit when I'm sitting, uh, sitting means I'm going to get attention from the human. And that's what will actually happen with pet petting with a purpose is the dog will start coming and sitting in front of people as its way of saying, I would like you to pet me because we've taught the dog in more desirable behavior. Now, it doesn't only have to sit. If the dog nut paws at me, I could tell it to sit, I could tell it to lie down. It just has to do something to change its state or prepay for the attention. So what we're basically telling the dog is you can't tell the humans what to do. You tell the human what to do, nothing happens. Human tells you what to do and you do it, you get rewarded. So the more that that happens consistently, the dog starts emulating and looking for, what, what would give me some attention? What if I go sit in front of the person? We call this manding or learning to mand. Um, so the more that we pet with a person and use passive training, the more the dog starts to want to please us by offering us these behaviors that we want, that we're demonstrating we like, because that's when we give the dog attention when we pet it. 
Um, let me see. Uh, maintenance. Uh, we want to talk about maintenance. We have a beautiful picture window. And we're not going to show it in the video, but uh, this is my neighborhood, and I've walked by and I've seen Bob sitting here with his chin on the couch or barking at sometimes if I have my dogs with me. And so he's good with dogs, but with people he's not always 100% comfortable with. And I think that he is getting the impression that he is in a security sentry position. So we talk about maintenance when we have dogs with behavior problems. We want to make sure we eliminate their opportunity to do things the wrong way. So we might do a Roman blind, which is a blind that's covering the bottom part of the window. Uh, we're also going to talk about rules not being allowed in the furniture. We'll talk about that in a sec. But if I can't look out the window when I'm up on the couch, then it takes away a little bit of the luster of being on the couch. And now I can't practice barking at the mailman and all the people that pass by in the neighborhood, and so I'm not practicing the wrong behavior. We want to eliminate opportunities to do the wrong behavior while we practice the right behavior. Once we've done that enough, we develop myelin over the neural pathways without getting too scientific. We just help the dog develop muscle memory doing the right thing. Now, to help the guardian start acting like leaders, we went over uh, uh, some rules that they can enforce. Um, now, uh, for dogs, the higher they sit, the more rank or status they have. So one of the first rules I suggest is no, not being allowed in the furniture. When I first came in, Bob was a little bit nervous. He relaxed, and then he kind of got a little spooked. Then he tried to jump up here while he was barking and lunging at me. He's trying to give himself some artificial authority. So when we're doing this, we want to take away that perception that we are peers, because letting a dog sit at the same height as you is one of the ways we say that. So uh, I recommend that we get a dog bed. We are going to have dog beds, but I would give each dog bed its own unique name. Message me if you forget how to create uh, the dog name uh, and reward the dog for going there. But the dog bed isn't as desirable if I can have the status of sitting on the furniture. But if I lose that status, then the dog bed becomes a lot more desirable. Um, let me see. Um, uh, directional commands. Go around your house with two treats, and in every room, if, if I'm in the door, room and here's the doorway and the hallway is here, the dog's in with me, I touch the dog's nose with my treat, toss it two or three feet out the door, when the dog goes out and gets it, I say the word out. It comes back, I do it again, and I go to a different portal, a different room in the house. Do this throughout the house. Try to do this a couple times a day for a week. After a while, you can be in any room and say out, and the dog will run outside the room automatically on its own because it's been conditioned and it is rewarded for doing that. Some of the other, uh, another directional command uh, that I do is off, if the dog's in the furniture, I would touch the nose with the treat and then toss the uh, treat down. When it gets down, I would say the word off instead of down. So we can come up with different command words. I also went over how to, uh, treat, uh, how to train dogs using passive training. So anytime you're walking towards your dog in a hallway and your dog backs up, if you just say the word retreat is the word I use, you could say reverse or whatever you want to say. I like retreat, it's kind of fun. Um, and after a while, the dog hears the word retreat while it's backing up. Then later on, when the dog's in your way, you say retreat, and the dog will back up out of your way. We again, it gave it another command word. And the more vocabulary we have, the more confident the dog's going to be because now it knows better how to please us um, and how to understand us. Um, that's something else the guardians might want to look into doing is going to YouTube or Google. YouTube is probably better. And search for easy dog tricks. Look for ways that we can increase uh, the dog's uh, self-restraint. So maybe teaching the dog to balance a treat on its nose and having to wait until somebody says now. And it looks, turns its head, it falls, and snatches it out of the ear or you know, stay, or different commands like that. It doesn't have to be those commands. Those are great commands because they develop self-control, but I think the more tricks that we teach him, the more confident he's gonna be. Just like us, we develop a new skill set, we feel a boost of self-esteem. I would not practice the shake because we already have some jumping up and proximity issues, and the dog's like, if you like this, you must really like this or this. So I would not avoid and not do the shake for now. We can do that later on. Um, let me see, the guardians, um, I, I think one of the guardians' problem is uh, she's really uh, a very, uh, she wants to get a lot of things accomplished, which is great in life, but when we have dogs with behavior problems, especially when we have fear or anxiety or uh, aggression, he doesn't have aggression, I think it's like fear, but I think the guardian has put him in positions where he's a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, and like he doesn't like the harness, he kind of shuts down when they put it on, but they put it on anyways and walk him because he needs the exercise. But if we create a conditioned emotional response and help him feel good about the harness, then he'll like going for walks and then he doesn't go out there with kind of a sullen mood. Uh, the write-up that's directly below this one on my website uh, should be for a Jack Russell Terrier named Lou. If you can't, you can just uh, search for Lou, L-O-U. Uh, and it's a cute little Jack Russell Terrier. It lives in the neighborhood and it's afraid of its uh, harness. And so I have a video there that shows how you can create a conditioned emotional response and help the dog like to have the harness on. Uh, but I think a lot of the times the guardians has taken the dog in situations where it gets, it's already not feeling comfortable because it's in the harness. It's on a walk and now people are out in the neighborhood and there's a couple other things. There's a whole bunch of things that happen at once and that just all of them add on to it and eventually the dog kind of explodes. 
So remember, when we're walking the dog, we want to pay attention to what the dog's doing, the dog's body language. Is the tail up or is it parallel with the spine? Are the ears forward or are they back? Is the dog staring, especially the lowered head, or is it relaxing? Remember, if your dog, if you're approaching someone and your dog turns its head to the side, it's a way of saying, I don't want to meet, I don't want to approach this person. So if you continue to force your dog to do that or force it to get petted by the person, that can break the trust a little bit and make the dog think, I have to protect myself. So I'm going to lunge at people on the leash. And the leash is problematic because we have to use it for laws and all that fun stuff, but dogs have a fight or flight response. So if I'm a dog and somebody's leading me up to someone that I'm uncomfortable with, the leash prevents me from running away. I have two choices, fight or flight. Well, flight is gone, I only have one choice. That's why the video that we did above, the behavior adjustment training, should, teaches the dog to move away. Remember when we're doing that, I'm not going to go through all the details in there because this is a long video and I'm a little bit late and uh, it's all encapsulated there. But I'd like the family to practice having people come over and do the same technique but go slowly. Uh, one of the guardians really uh, wants a perfect dog like we all do. And I think she's probably put a, moved the dog a little bit too far too fast. So we want to just take this supremely slowly. We don't want to move on to the next step until the dog is completely relaxed and passive. Because there are times where it seems like he just reacts out of nowhere. Well, I think he's got so much cortisol in his blood and his adrenal glands have been activated so long, I think he's a little bit stressed and on edge. And so the more the guardians assume the leadership role by making, not allowing him on the furniture, by making him sit to go through a door, by not allowing him within seven pe uh, people who are eating, by having to wait to eat food that's waiting in his bowl for the humans to eat first. All these things help the dog develop self-control, uh, look for ways to develop, uh, to self-restrain, uh, waiting for permission to eat the food or go the, out the door or whatever it is. The more that we can do that, the more the dog starts to kind of figure that out on its own rather than us trying to figure out and micromanage everything that it's doing in its life. Um, so I'm trying to think. Uh, the guardians should definitely eat something before the dog eats. Five or more bites of a solid, but it'd be preferable if we could actually eat, see, uh, put food in the dog bowl, sit down at the table, eat dinner, and then when we get done, go over and give the dog permission to eat. The dog goes over and sniffs the bowl. Right now he's free feeding, so I'm guessing for the first couple days he's not going to eat. So he sniffs the bowl and walks away, pick up the bowl, dump it without any sympathy, and then put the bowl back down. What you're saying is when you walk away from the bowl, the food goes away. And uh, so after a while, and then all day long, I walk by the empty bowl. Right now, every time he walks by the bowl, it's full, so there's no impetus to eat it. After a while, then I notice the bowl's empty, bowl's empty, bowl's empty, and I only can eat after the humans, so the humans have more status than I do. And uh, the humans are controlling access to my food. So that makes them more, me more dependent on them and makes me see them more as acting like leaders. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, I'm probably forgetting a whole bunch of stuff, but uh, the Guardians, I don't want to go over too much stuff here. We're actually about four hours into the session, but I want them to really focus on the behavior adjustment training that I have in the video above. I want to practice having a lot of people come over. Make sure and follow the steps that are in there. If you have questions about them, make sure you message me. I'm guessing that we're probably going to need to do a follow-up session to build on progress for that. Probably about a month or so, and the Guardians will let me know. And like I said, they live... I'm like, I could have walked here from my house. So it's nice and convenient, which is a nice bonus. Um, all right, anything else I'm forgetting? that um, I think I encapsulate most of it. Um, the escalating consequences. Make sure you use the escalating consequences to disagree, but don't ever have any of your guests doing it because it's something that I think the dog would disagree with. All right, well, this is uh, Bob's Roadmap to Success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.